thank you so much for having me. It's very exciting to be here. It's a really good turnout and we're really excited to, to talk about this topic. Um, we're going to talk to you today, or I'm going to talk to you today about uh, voluntary emissions uh, reduction initiatives in the oil and gas industry. We, we put together a report recently because, you know, we thought that there was quite a lot of noise in this space and, and there's a need to make sense of it. Um, so I'm going to go over the, the report. Um, I also want to mention before even getting started that Chandler Billinghurst, who introduced himself earlier today, is uh, is kind of the mastermind behind uh, this re uh, report, and he did a lot of the work, um, the research, and the groundwork to to get us rolling on this thing. So um, he's he's joining us for the ride today. Um, the the real purpose intention of this talk, I think, and you know, this is the first time I, I talk about it in public. Um, I I want to encourage kind of an open discussion around these ideas and to stimulate conversation and and ideas. I I, I want to manage expectations by saying that I'm by no means an, an expert on these things. We we started diving into this topic because we felt there was kind of a void of understanding and um, cohesiveness and uh, expertise. And so I feel like there's a lot of really smart people on this call and we can all kind of work on these things together and, and start to flesh out kind of some of the solutions to the challenges that remain. Uh, the other kind of caveat I'll put forth before getting going is that there's likely issues and mistakes. We've, we've already um, encountered a few problems with the report and small details that were, were incorrect. And so feel free to, you know, we welcome all kinds of feedback. So please let us know if, uh, if I say anything that's not accurate or, or flat out wrong. I wouldn't uh, be surprised if that happened. Um, and the other thing is I'm not going to try to talk too long. Um, you can read the report. It's free. It's, you can just go to our website and, and grab it. So I'm kind of going to try and focus on Kind of the the really valuable discussion that I think is going to going to come out of this presentation. So just quickly on on Highwood, uh, we're a consultancy focused on greenhouse gas emissions management. We're based in Calgary. Uh, we do lots of work with different stakeholders. Um, our primary clients are in industry. Uh, these are primarily oil and gas companies who are trying to understand and navigate the the energy transition and understand how to set targets and reduce their emissions and what strategies to use and how to access different opportunities and mitigate risks and, and all of this kind of stuff. Um, so we help them in carbon markets and stuff like the voluntary initiatives and uh, implementing projects and, and so on and so forth. And then we work with innovators as well to um, help them understand how to deploy technologies and connect them with the industry and understand kind of their, their market fit and, and their pitch and, and, and get regulatory approval in, in the various jurisdictions who are allowing methane measurement technologies now. Um, but we like to see ourselves kind of at the interface of these kind of different stakeholders who are kind of working together, scientists and regulators as well, to try and figure out how to most effectively implement uh, these technologies that, in this changing, rapidly changing landscape. And so this, this landscape of managing methane emissions, and most of you know this stuff, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I like to think of it in terms of risks and opportunities. And so there's all kinds of risks right now. Uh, the big one is, is loss of narrative control. And this is one that our clients are talking about quite a lot, uh, quite a lot lately. So um, David Lyon on the call and, and work that and those folks at EDF are doing um, in the Permian Basin with Permian Map and the upcoming methane set. Uh, these are really good examples of how methane emissions are now starting to be measured um, independently. And the, that narrative control that the oil and gas industry used to have is slowly um, becoming, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, kind of less, more difficult to control, you could say. Um, but there's all kinds of other risks, investor confidence and declining competitiveness. Um, if, you're, if you're really kind of behind the ball, then there could be issues with compliance and, and so on and so forth. There's also lots of opportunities. Understanding what your emissions are is, is, is really powerful because, you know, it's possible to monetize um, emissions reductions. This is especially true in Canada right now with offset markets, with funding opportunities. The Canadian government has announced a billion dollars over the last year, more than a billion dollars for methane reduction initiatives. Um, I can imagine with the new administration in the US and pending regulations changing here that similar thing is gonna happen before long. Um, building confidence with investors, um, understanding how to potentially differentiate your, your oil and gas products, which we'll talk a little bit about today um, and, and other things. And so ma managing this, this balance of risk and opportunities is something that's on the minds of a, of a lot of oil and gas companies right now. Um, and we're, we're seeing kind of big changes. And so we're seeing kind of a big gap between energy companies who are really leading the charge in this space and really investing the energy and the money uh, to achieve emissions reductions. Um, 
and I should probably have these points backwards. Um, and these progressive companies uh, really want to take credit for those reductions. But because methane is just such a new topic and measuring methane is relatively new to everyone, um, it's not really clear for them how to take advantage of kind of leading the charge. Um, but on the other side of the equation, you have consumers who are really interested in, you know, maybe spending a little bit more money and they're, they want low carbon choices. And so there's kind of an opportunity here uh, and a big question mark, which a lot of folks are, are working on, which is how do we build the bridge between these kind of um, energy companies who are leading the charge and, and really doing that good work um, and, the, um, and, the, and the end users who are potentially willing to pay a little bit more for um, for sustainable product. And the question really comes to how can industry demonstrate this excellence, um, excellence in general, but in specifically emissions reduction excellence. And uh, there have been a number of, of opportunities to do so and, and the landscape is changing really quickly. And so if, if you're an oil and gas, if you're an oil and gas company right now and you Google, um, how, do I, how do I take credit for my emissions reductions? Uh, you could get all kinds of stuff popping up, right? Um, and so this is kind of one of the things that we're dealing with and, and our clients are asking us, you know, what are the opportunities? There's, there's all these different voluntary initiatives out there. What do we choose? How do we make sense of it? What is this, you know, landscape? What are, what are kind of the benefits of participating or, and what are the costs of participating? Is this something that, that we should do? And uh, I apologize, Anna, I, I used your new logo <laughs> for the Trust Bowl certification on my next, or one of my, future slides, but, but uh, I still have the old one on here, I'll change it. Um, and, and so kind of in order to make sense of this kind of crazy space and, and all the noise and all these opportunities, um, we uh, have been working for the last several months to put together this voluntary emissions reduction initiatives report. Um, and really this has been kind of a learning process for us. Uh, we dove in knowing not very much and we started just kind of talking to people and collecting information looking at free online resources and um, uh, and kind of trying to make progress in this in this space. And uh, at the end, we kind of thought, well, you know, this is we've kind of come up with a lot of really valuable information. Let's let's kind of share it because there's still a lot of knowledge gaps and there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, so let's get this thing out there and start some conversations about what the work is that we need to do and, and how we can move forward together uh, kind of in this space. Um, so I'm just going to kind of step through some of the some of the key points of the of the report. Uh, but if you want to find it, it's uh, it's online. It's on our website. You can go and download it. It's uh, it's totally free and available. So one of the first things we did when we started looking at these reports is we we started thinking about okay, you know, these things are there's kind of some buckets here, and they're kind of naturally being split into different categories. So what are these categories? Um, and we went through a few iterations of this. Uh, and what we ended up deciding is uh, that there's kind of four general categories of voluntary initiatives. These are certifications, commitments, guidelines, uh, and ESG ratings. I'll caveat by saying we, we really did our best to categorize these into, into buckets that, that made sense. Um, but not all of the voluntary initiatives are really clear cut in terms of where they fall. And these categories are not always mutually uh, exclusive. Uh, but broadly speaking, Certifications um, hold participants to binding standards. Um, it's a declaration of achievement. So you can think about organic food uh, is a good, a, a good example and, and one that we've talked about in, in Meta before uh, of a certification type system where you do something and then you prove that you did it and then you get a badge that shows that you were verified and, and that you did do that thing in fact. Commitments are a little bit different because instead of demonstrating what you've already done, it's more about looking to the future. And so there's kind of a goal in the end. Commitments are typically binding and there, and there are check-ins, um, but uh, the, there's kind of that different framing of like, it's, it's more of a forward-looking uh, type of approach. Guidelines are, uh, are similar. It's, it's more of a set of frameworks, standards, principles, uh, and tools uh, that are kind of set forth by one of these administering organizations that could be followed by participants. Um, they're similar to commitments, but in, in comparison commit to commitments, they're kind of more focused on, on process um, and uh, not necessarily the, the end goal. Um, and you can see some examples on the bottom of all of these slides. OGMP is a really good example of one that could fall into some of the various buckets. Um, and at some point we just kind of had to make a judgment call of, of where, to, where to stick it. 
Uh, and then ESG ratings is kind of the, the final category. They're similar to certifications because you're um, getting kind of an evaluation on the basis of work that you've already done. Uh, it's an appraisal of, of where you're at. Um, but unlike, uh, unlike these, there's kind of no kind of specific declaration of achievement of, of a goal. Instead, these ESG ratings will provide companies generally speaking with questionnaires, or they'll look at kind of publicly published ESG reports uh, and evaluate kind of the contents of those reports and assign scores. And, and some of these ESG ratings kind of flirt the boundary or the scope of whether they would be considered voluntary or not, uh, because some of them just kind of do it anyways and provide companies a ranking without their, without their kind of explicit involvement. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the, the general just a bit. Um, the other thing that we did uh, when we were looking at these is kind of figure out, we, we initially started calling these accountability levels, um, but we're, we're kind of proposing uh, disclosure levels. And so this is kind of to describe how data or information is transferred or kind of disclosed uh, between the companies and uh, either the public or the organization that's administering the voluntary initiative. Um, and so we're really just kind of proposing these. Um, we kind of went through a few iterations of, of disclosure levels as well, and we're open to different ideas on how, uh, how this could, how this could uh, best work. Um, but in general, we, we kind of have chosen six disclosure levels. So level one, there's really no exchange of information happening. You can think of this, you know, typical for some of the guidelines where companies can choose to follow guidelines, but nobody's really checking in on them. Uh, at level two, you have self-reporting, uh, but there's really no verification of the reporting that's been done. Um, level three, after level three, you start to get verification. So in level three, you're getting kind of verification of data that's been reported by a participant, uh, by an independent third party or administering organization. Level four, um, now you start to get into measurements. And so it's not just kind of self-reported checklists and data. Um, there's actually measurements that are being uh, performed um, and, and, and reported on. Um, measurements again in level five, but the difference here is that the, the measurements are being performed by an independent third party. Uh, and then level six is one that we just kind of made up because uh, it doesn't exist yet. And so this is kind of the detailed public disclosure of unaggregated un measured data. Um, and we kind of just put this one out there to, to, just to kind of start the conversation around, could this ever happen? Uh, would this ever happen? Uh, generally speaking, how reporting generally works these uh, so far is is that um, you know data are reported and then some administering organization will aggregate the data and and kind of blur the lines around uh, what it means and it, it it kind of decreases a lot of the value of, of the information um, that's present there and so um, yeah this is kind of the some some notion of an ideal uh, I guess you could say. And, and the one thing I want to kind of uh, mention, you know, with these disclosure levels and these categories is that we're not trying to say that that one level is better, you know, that level six is better than level one or that one type of category is better than another. Um, what, we're, what we're trying to do is just kind of provide a framework for comparing different types of initiatives. And um, you, you'll see later on that some of these initiatives um, are kind of could be considered to be, you know, more, you know, less, less rigorous. Uh, some of them are more rigorous, but the less rigorous ones um, enable participation in ways by companies that may not be ready for the more uh, rigorous standards. And, and so there, um, they have a definitely have an important role to play in the space. Um, so we kind of went through um, for the different, I think we looked at 20 different voluntary initiatives uh, and we went through and for each one, we kind of put together uh, you know, quick fact boxes and tables, and um, uh, we wrote kind of one page kind of synopsis for each one of these um, 20 different uh, voluntary initiatives and all that stuff in the report. We kind of evaluated the, the initiatives across a range of, of different um, criteria, including kind of what category they are, you know, what the eligibility requirements are, uh, the disclosure levels, how much membership and traction they're getting. Um, the, the scope of emissions and the technology requirements and, and so on and so forth. Um, for the tables, I'm, I'm just kind of showing you these to, to show you that they exist. I'm not gonna kind of go through them uh, in, any, in any detail because we don't really have time uh, to do that uh, yet. Um, and uh, I'll, 
also note that Anna sent us a note saying that the number of participants for the Project Canary Trust Well uh, responsible gas has, has actually increased uh, significantly since we put the table together. And so the, the other thing to note is, you know, with this report, this space is just changing so ridiculously fast that it's outdated already, even though we published it this month. Um, and so we're think, trying to think about how we, you know, keep it up to date and having, you know, revisions and republishing it at kind of regular intervals and that kind of thing to, uh, to keep things, uh, to keep things accurate. Um, but I guess the big thing I'll note on certifications here is that they, they're all relatively young. Um, and um, well, well, a couple of them are relatively young. Um, and, and participation tends to be relatively low, except obviously for ISO, which, which is kind of a different, kind of a different piece. But for the commitments, there's quite a few of them. Participation rates tend to be uh, quite a bit higher for the, for the commitments. Uh, and that's generally because it's easier to, I think it's easier to say that you'll do something than to prove that you've already done something. Um, uh, but that's kind of just my hypothesis there and I'm kind of open to debate <laughs> on that one. Um, the guidelines uh, as well, participation rates are, are relatively high. There's um, sector standards for oil and gas, which is, you know, we're kind of still uh, awaiting uh, that one. Um, and then uh, the ESG ratings, this is really just a sample. Uh, there's a whole slew of ESG ratings out there. Uh, and these are the kind of the oldest ones that have, have generally been around for a long time. Uh, the climate change score, uh, CDP is kind of the, the one that's most focused on emissions or greenhouse gas emissions. The others tend to be more broadly ESG ratings that consider the, the social governance aspects and the other parts of environment, which are, are often forgotten, including water and, and soil and, and that kind of stuff. Um, all right, so key findings. I'm just gonna run through these quickly so that we can kind of get going on a, on a conversation. Um, the first is that verification uh, through independent auditing is generally the exception. Um, this is something that seems to be changing, um, but uh, you know, a lot of the newer ones are kind of gravitating uh, more towards verification. Um, it's even more the exception uh, when you talk about requiring the use of measurement technologies. Uh, and so independent measurement and auditing is, is even rarer. Um, but, uh, but I think this is kind of, if you look at the trends over time, this is, you know, we're kind of moving in this direction a little bit more. Voluntary initiatives tend to be broad in, in geographical and, and sectoral scope. So most of the initiatives tend to welcome participation from anywhere in the world. And they, they tend to kind of cover the full value chain from production all the way to distribution. Um, so most initiatives are non-prescriptive in terms of the technology use. Uh, so um, understand, I mean, the, the idea here is that you are taking uh, measurements of your methane emissions and other, and other greenhouse gases uh, or estimates and uh, disclosing them in some way in many cases. Um, but how those measurements are taken is usually vague and non-prescriptive. And as I think uh, there's a big kind of focus on this in this group anyways, um, and, and a lot of expertise in uh, working on a lot of these new technologies and understanding how to use these new technologies. Um, and so the, there's still kind of a big link between uh, what the role of these measurement technologies is in demonstrating and collecting data and how to collect that data and demonstrating that you know, you've achieved reductions or at least you're on, you're on the right track for your, for your reduction efforts or, or achieving performance or at least the right actions. Commitments, as I mentioned a second ago, are kind of the most common uh, type of voluntary initiative. Certifications are, are picking up steam. Um, uh, I would say ESG ratings are very, very common as well, but they, they don't necessarily revolve around emissions in the same way that a lot of the commitments do. Participation is often limited to companies. And so this is one that was kind of interesting that came up. Um, basically, uh, the idea here is that there should be no reason for, you know, an entire jurisdiction uh, or an industry group potentially to participate in, in, in some of these initiatives. Um, the interplay is really interesting between regulations and voluntary initiatives because the initiatives in some ways, some of them anyways, um, provide a set of rules and reporting requirements. And so um, they can be seen as kind of rudimentary or voluntary sets of regulations. Depending on where you live, these voluntary initiatives either go above and beyond the regulations that already exist or the regulations are kind of 
you know, encompass the voluntary initiative requirements. And so in cases where the voluntary, the regulations encompass those requirements, presumably really all you would need is to be compliant with the regulations in order to demonstrate that you actually meet the requirements for these initiatives. Um, certification programs are relatively new. I've touched on this a little bit. Um, participation rates are still relatively low, but based on kind of anecdotal evidence, and um, um, I'm, I'm sure Anna can speak to this, and I've, uh, I, can, I can attest that having spoken to the folks at MIQ and Ethical Origins, they're uh, getting a lot of interest, and uh, the, they're, they're very, very busy these days with companies who are interested in uh, getting involved with some of these certification programs. Um, and then the other one is related to Disclosure Level 6 is that full public disclosure is, is never required uh, in, by most of these initiatives. So um, that's something we can get into a little bit later as well. Just quickly, we, we identified a number of knowledge gaps and I think the researchers on the, on the line will be most interested in, in this part because uh, this is kind of, there's kind of lots of ideas and things that we can work on together to, to motivate us. And so one of them is just voluntary initiative selection. Um, this is maybe not kind of a great, the best example of a research question, but um, understanding from industry's perspective, how do we choose between or among these different voluntary initiatives? Should I do one or 20? Um, and which ones are best and which ones are, are the worst? And uh, should I avoid? Uh, related to that and informing, number one, is understanding the benefits of participation. Understanding the costs is, is, is also crucial. Um, the, the benefits are poorly quantified and poorly communicated, I've found. Um, and I think that's just largely because the space is A, changing very, very quickly, um, and B, there aren't really reliable metrics and the benefits are often quite intangible and difficult to measure. Um, the costs are also uh, kind of um, not clear. So some of the certification programs will kind of list their, the costs um, quite clearly in terms of, you know, this is what you need to pay to participate. Um, but the part that's um, less, you know, poorly constrained is, you know, these companies generally have limited resources in their environment departments uh, and they are, they have to task people to do this work. Um, so how many people, how, how much, you know, how much labor is required to maintain certifications and to fill out all the paperwork and to make sure all the surveys and the inspections are getting done, uh, you know, to spec and then all this kind of stuff. So understanding kind of what those kind of internalized um, costs are is, uh, is, is, is crucial for encouraging companies to participate. Um, one of the things that also came up was that, you know, a lot of these kind of buzzwords are used like sustainability and transparency, transparency and disclosure and impartiality, but there isn't kind of a lot of consensus on, on what these terms necessarily mean and, and they're used and they tend to be used in different ways. Um, and so having, we, we kind of propose a glossary in the, in the report um, as a starting point for thinking about how to, how to kind of um, communicate better in this space, but um, having a clearer understanding of what different initiatives mean when they use these terms is, is something that would be useful. Understanding the long-term viability of these initiatives, I think, is, is important too. Um, so methane is a brand new problem. I think we're kind of at the beginning of solving it and we're making huge gains and everyone's talking about low-hanging fruit and, and all this kind of stuff. Don't get me wrong, we're all here because there's still a ton of work to do and it's going to take a long time to solve this problem. Um, but the idea is that we will solve it, or at least we're, we're hoping to solve it. And so um, what is kind of the role of these initiatives in the long term? I, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if anyone, I think a few of you here are towards the end of the talk by MIQ when I asked, I think it was Lara Owens, I asked her, you know, is, is the idea that you're going to um, work yourself into obsolescence um, because, um, you know, so many uh, oil and gas companies, you know, start to sign up and get their emissions down below, you know, 0.25% intensity level or, or whatever the requirement is, um, so that there, it's, it's, you know, there's no one to differentiate yourself against ultimately in the long run. And, and her response was like, yeah, totally, that would be great. So, <laughs> um, and then um, understanding the role of technology and measurement, I think there's a lot of conversation that can be had around this. Um, so how do we, there's so many different types of measurement that can be taken at different spatial and temporal scales, different information products um, that arise from these different types of measurements. So understanding how these can be used together or separately as part of these initiatives in ways that won't favor, you know, necessarily favor individual or particular companies, but approaches to measurement, I think is, is really important. 
Um, and I got a note from Dan Zimmerly at MeTech saying that, that they're working on this. So I look forward to kind of hearing what they, they come up with. Uh, the role of standardization. Um, so, you know, how, how far do we want to go with standardizing these initiatives and is there value in that? Um, it's kind of, there's this perennial uh, kind of trade-off between depth and breadth and also standardization versus kind of letting these initiatives kind of run free um, and the value that might come from that. Right now we're kind of weighing heavily on the side of the spectrum of, of madness and um, unstandardization, I guess. So um, I, I would argue that there's there's a role for standardization. It's just not clear how far we want to go with that. Uh, and then understanding voluntary initiatives is advanced regulation. So we have Lindsay Campbell on the line from AER and potentially other regulators who are probably interested in understanding how these initiatives and um, regulations can work together, potentially, um, how learnings from initiatives could translate into regulations and, and vice versa. Um, and, and, and what the roles and responsibilities are of these different organizations. So last slide, moving forward. Um, I, I mean, at the end of the report, we kind of call on various stakeholders to do certain things. And so we, we call on the oil and gas industry to, to embrace transparency and disclosure. Uh, we take the position that it's inevitable, the, that you know, this data is gonna get out one way or the other, and it's better to get ahead of the curve and to be reporting and to be taking responsibility for your emissions and, uh, and working with whatever the reality is to, to get towards a place where uh, emissions are lower. Um, we call for harmonization of data collection and, and reporting um, so that um, uh, even though there might be different initiatives with different criteria and different standards, um, the ways that data collect are collected and reported are, are, are more or less consistent to enable um, kind of better communication among uh, different types of results. Uh, quantify and communicate the value proposition. So this one falls in the, uh, this is the responsibility of the, those administering these organizations. So um, uh, basically from the perspective of industry, why should I participate? What is the value proposition of participating in these uh, initiatives and, and what is the cost for doing so? Um, we have a number of clients who, if that value, value proposition was very clear, they would, they would likely jump right on it. Um, understanding uh, investor and end user demands. I I'll be the first to step forward and say that I spend almost zero time and uh, I'm ashamed to say talking to people in finance and investors and understanding what they're looking for. And um, uh, this is something that I, I think that there needs to be more conversations and more connections between Wall Street uh, and scientists and industry. Uh, to figure out how we can work on these harmonization challenges and work together to build systems that work. Uh, understanding measurement and technology. Um, I mean, this is this one could you could talk about forever, and I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna jump into it. But what is the role of these different measurement and measurement uh, types and different technologies, and and how can we uh, kind of standardize the those kinds of results that come out of those systems? Uh, and then building a roadmap. So this is more speaking to guiding. Um, guiding industry um, and giving them kind of uh, a roadmap for them to understand kind of what decisions to make um, and how to navigate the space. And so that's likely something that we'll continue to work on moving forward. Um, because this, I have one more slide, but I just want to kind of, you can snapshot this one in your mind because I want to turn this to the audience and say, eh, you know, how do we do these things? I think we can build a really good conversation out of that co collectively. I don't have answers, so I'm, I'm looking to you folks to, to kind of start answering these questions. Uh, how do we achieve one through six? If you want the report, just head to our website. You can download it. I'll also say that we have uh, a free interactive mini conference coming up. It's a two hour conference um, and that's in about three weeks. So you can contact me for information. It's posted all over LinkedIn. We're hosting that in collaboration with the Gas Technology Institute and Petroleum Technology Alliance Canada. We already have over 200 registrants and it's three weeks away. So I think it's gonna be a pretty, a pretty good event and we have some great speakers lined up. So uh, be sure to register for that free event uh, when you can. So thank you so much.